me know. Well, good evening, folks. It is good to see you tonight. Good to see some new folks with us tonight. So if you haven't, uh, if you look around and don't know someone, make sure you say hi tonight. Um, that would be great. Uh, before I have some prayer with you, I am going to ask for a couple volunteers to read uh, two passages of Scripture for me as we begin. The first one is Genesis 18, uh, verses 17 to 19. Anybody want to take that tonight? Genesis, if you would please, 18. Genesis is the first book of the Bible, so you don't have to wonder where it is. All right, Genesis 18. Anybody want to take that one for me tonight? Going once, yes, thank you, Steve. Genesis 18, 17 and 19. Now the harder one, I'm looking for Amos, chapter 3, verses 6 to 7. Amos, third chapter, verses 6 and 7. Jeff has it in the back. Thank you very much. Um, if you could please read that for us. Steve, Genesis 18, 17 and 19. It's an amazing passage of scripture. It's in the context of God um, about ready to destroy what two major cities, Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18 uh, and 19. Jeff, can you take me down just a little bit on the sound side of things, please? Thank you. And what he does, I, I find it very interesting, is that God is about ready to do something. He has a future plan of destruction and he says, should I hide this from the guy that I made a covenant with? He didn't have to tell Abraham. He could have just went and destroyed those cities and been done with it. But for some reason, he includes his servant, Abraham, in this prophetic discussion. And it is prophetic because it is what, church? It's in the future. It's in the very near future. Uh, but it is a future event. Abraham doesn't know what's going to be going on. Uh, the Lord came down. We, we call that a Christophany. He came down with two other angels. The Lord was going to separate himself out from those two other angelic beings. And then those angels would find themselves in, of course, uh, Sodom uh, at Lot's house with his wife and two daughters and saying, hey, let's get out of town. Um, there is an Old Testament typology there that talks about God. Um, giving warning to his people to get out or we are going to remove you out. It's an interesting word there because if you look at Genesis 19, when the angels went to Lot's house, they had to pull them out of the house. <laughs> interesting, isn't it? That's just kind of the same word for rapture, by the way. Harpazo in Greek means to catch up or to to to. Um, catch away it's a, it's a it's a little bit more of a violent word pulling somebody that the thing that I find interesting about Abraham in that is if you read down farther in the text God tells Abraham that he's going to judge and I think God does it as if we follow the text because Abram was a prophet we think prophets prophesy but prophets also do something else. It starts with a P. Do you know? Do you know what Abraham did immediately after God told him that? What did he do? He prayed. He prayed. Lord, if there's 50 righteous people in that city, are you going to destroy them? I mean, that doesn't sound like your character. Lord, if there's 45 people. Lord, if there's 40. And, you know, Abraham keeps whittling it down though he gets to about 10 and says, Lord, if there's just 10 people there, are, will you destroy it? And, and he learns something about God, that God is a merciful God, that God listens, God hears, God communicates. Um, but at the end of the day, God has a plan because he knows the hearts of those individuals. And he did not find 10 righteous men in that city, which is scary. 
And he pulls, of course, Lot, his wife, and their two daughters. Their son-in-laws uh, engaged, of course, laughed it off and didn't believe, much like in the days of Noah. Um, but I like that passage because it once again tells us that in God's prophetic plan, he doesn't hide it. He, what's the name of our lesson? Our, our, he reveals. Revelation, God reveals. And if we're taking a lesson from Abraham, he reveals that to us as his people so that we might what? Pray for those who are in the path of judgment and destruction. All right, Amos, Jeff, if you would please, third chapter, uh, verses uh, whatever that was, six and seven, please, yes. Wow, it's a pretty powerful passage, isn't it? Um, that's kind of a, that we call that in, uh, in language, 100% language. The Lord does not do anything unless he reveals it to his prophets. God is not in the business of hiding things. He's in the business of revealing things so that we can pray about it. We can pray for people so that we can warn people. That's what Amos is talking about. We sound the, the trumpet. There's something going on that the people need to be warned about him, and God is not hiding that. God is revealing that that's coming, and that's the God that we have. And I just want you to be reminded of that as we keep moving into the text of Revelation itself, uh, that God, once again, as we enter into Revelation, Revelation is not a book where God is seeking to hide things from you. Revelation is a book in which God is willing to reveal things to you. He wants you to understand it. He wants you to know what's coming and how it's coming. And we've got to wrestle with all of the things we've been looking at the last two weeks and in even tonight. Um, and so uh, just be mindful of the God that you, you serve and you worship, that he's a God who's merciful and gracious and he gives us warning. And um, he's been giving us 2,000 years of warning, by the way. So we can't say that God is unfair and all God's people said. He has been warning every generation for 2,000 years that he's about ready to do something. And if it should come in our lifetime, uh, there's no one that's going to stand before him and say, we didn't know. Uh, the only reason that would happen is because the church didn't do their job, which is to warn people about the impending judgment that's going to be coming on this world and especially on unbelievers. With that in mind, can we have some prayer together as we begin? Father, we love you. Thank you so much for your goodness to us and for passages like Genesis and Amos that really talk to us about who you are. You are the great revealer, um, especially when it comes to bringing judgment uh, into this world. We saw that with Abraham. We hear it in the words of Amos. And we see it in the book of Revelation. And so we ask, Lord, that you'll just give us wisdom to understand uh, you have revealed, and we just need eyes to see it, ears to hear it, and a heart that truly understands. And so uh, be gracious with us tonight as we, uh, on this last night of prep work, uh, Lord, that we would be attentive to how different views look at Revelation, so that when we're in conversation with other people, they may disagree with us, and at least we'll have some idea of why. And so God, help us with that tonight, we pray. We ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, please. Amen. Thank you so very much. We are in the last page of uh, session one worksheet. And we're going to be looking at just three remaining uh, items, but they're most important because they have to do with interpretation. And so I'm going to give these to you in a very quick, rapid pace, just verbally. And that is, what does it say? What did it mean to the people who received it? Third, what does it mean to me? That's the three interpretive ladders that you need to do when you're studying the scripture. You can't skip the first one. You can't skip the second one and go right to the third. You will not get the third right if you do that. What does it say? All right, that's the first one. And that's what we want to look at tonight. We want to say, what does the text say? 
Can anybody tell me what three languages the Bible is written in? German, French, and English. No. All right. Um, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. The Bible was not translated into Latin until Jerome. The, a great majority of the New Testament was written in, well, the New Testament was written in Greek, but the LXX or the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, you find a lot of Greek Septuagint language in the New Testament. So when you see Paul quoting, or even Jesus quoting Hebrew scriptures, they're often not in Hebrew, they're often in Greek helps you out. You find the, the majority of the Aramaic text in predominantly one book in the Old Testament. Anybody guess what it is? It, uh, it, a little trivia question because uh, I, uh, I asked, I kind of went through this with you about lesson one or two. You think it's a prophetic book, but it's not in the prophetic books. It's Daniel. Yeah. Daniel has a lot of Aramaic sections in his book. So that's probably one of those leading areas. So what does it say? What does that mean? What does it say? Well, that has to do with language and words and grammar and syntax and context. It has to do with all of those things that have to do with Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic. Now, if you're not Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic scholars, you're wondering, well, then how in the world are we ever going to be able to do that? Well, it's called trusting in the scholars who interpreted Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic into English. Uh, and they did a very good job of that. But it is language. And there are certain words that don't translate well. Does that make sense? So, for example, uh, there are those who say, well, I like this particular version because it's word for word. Sorry, you don't know, you don't know your Bible. You cannot word for word Hebrew into English. It doesn't work. It just doesn't. It's like a lot of other languages, Spanish and German and French. You have a certain word and you, if you have to translate that into the English, it can't, it's not a word for word translation. It's a word for thought translation. This is what the word means. Uh, Deb and I were um, in Bavaria a number of years ago. Um, we were visiting a family there and uh, their sons, they were all from America. Uh, but they had lived in, in Germany for most of their life. When they came home, it was interesting to hear them. They were speaking in German, and every once in a while, they'd throw in an English word. And I said, why do you guys do that? And they said, there's no word in German for that. <laughs> so how do we... we it, language is like that. And so you just have to be aware that uh, sometimes in English, uh, the English has to phrase it rather than word it. Uh, and it does its best to communicate what that is. And so you just have to check scripture to scripture to make sure that you have a deep understanding. Um, if you have a Strong's Concordance, remember those old big books years ago? Now you can get them online, download them. You can get a Strong's number that tells you what the Greek word means or the Hebrew or the Aramaic. Those are great resources that you can get online. Uh, that will help you to see what does that word actually mean in the original language. And sometimes you need to do your homework on that. I've heard sermons that were on a particular word in the New Testament, and right off the bat I went, this is going to be a really bad sermon. Because that's not what the word means. Uh, you know, the guy didn't do his homework. And uh, so, you know, if... if uh, I've always said this, if you're a sailor and your boat's in the harbor and you're making a very long voyage uh, through one of the oceans and you have to get from point A to point B, hey, what does it matter if your compass is only off one degree? You're going to wind up in Greenland. Uh, yeah, one degree over a long period of time takes you way off of your mark. And 
Yeah. And so you, you have to be careful about where your starting point is and then you have to make sure you've got course corrections when you're studying the scriptures. So the first thing that you have to really look at is what does the text say, all right? So when we get into Revelation, that's the first thing that we as students of God's word need to do. We need to look, and I'm gonna be helping with that because I'm a verse by verse guy. So we're gonna look at verse one, and my first question to you is going to be, what does it say? All right, we're not looking at what it means yet. We're just looking at words. We're looking at, last week, similes and metaphors and parts of speech and how things are arranged. And if, I said this last week, if you hate English, uh, you're gonna have to bear with me on some of these things because I'm gonna be pointing out prepositional phrases and direct objects and those types of things. Why? Because you have to. That's how you understand what it's saying. All right, and there's going to be some times where we're going to look at what John says through in Revelation, and we're going to go, you know, this is a very similar passage, but he didn't use the same language over there as he did here. Why did he change his language? Something's different. You see that in the New Testament. You expect a word that Paul's going to use because he's used it over and over and over, and all of a sudden it's like, wow, he didn't use the same word. This is different. He didn't use this, the normal Greek word for holy, agias. He used another Greek word, hostios. Why did he use that word and not this word? You have to figure that out, all right? So grammar and syntax, which means sentence structure and context, you know, where is it in the context of the scripture? And of course, we have immediate context, which is what we're dealing with right here. And then you have mediate context, which is kind of the larger circle around it. And then you have the larger context, which is how does this fit in with the, either the chapter or the book or the section that you look at. Everything has to fit together in order for this to work. So what does it say? It's language and words and syntax, um, grammatical things that most people hate. Uh, but we'll work through it together and make it not boring for you. Second, what did it mean? But qualifier is the qualification is what? To them. I, I've got to figure out when God gives this revelation, the Father gives this revelation to Jesus, who gives it to an angel, who gives it to John. John isn't living in 21st century Western United States of America. So I can't take words or ideas or concepts that John is seeing and receiving and jam them into my world. It doesn't work that way. I've got to go into his world to figure that out. What did it mean to those who received it? And that's called the cultural context itself. And I want to just show you uh, just a number of resources that are in my library. I've got way more than this, but just to give you an idea of things that I chase uh, when I need to really fill in the blanks around something that perhaps I don't know. So I'm just going to take these randomly. Uh, you've got a, a couple of historical works. You have the works of Josephus. Have you ever heard of that before? works of Josephus. Josephus was actually a Jewish general during the 70th, uh, the 70 uh, revolt uh, when the Roman emperor came in, when um, um, Titus Augustus came in and destroyed the city. And Josephus basically saved his rear end by making a prophecy that Titus would become the next emperor. He did. And then the emperor repaid him by making him the sort of the empirical historian. He didn't kill him. He put him into his inner circle. And so you've got all of the history of that here. Why is that important? Because AD 70, something happened, the destruction of church, the temple, Jerusalem itself. And as we're gonna be looking uh, in our next section, there are some folks who look at Revelation and say, that has nothing to do with the future. All of that happened in AD 70. It's, it was all done and over with. So we're just looking backwards at an event that happened and trying to extrapolate some spiritual principles out of that. Josephus helps me with that. Josephus tells me 
uh, where these things happened. Jo Josephus tells me where a remnant of the Jews ran. I remind Deb of this often when I hear all of these Jordanian trips to what place? Do you know? It's in the Red Rocks in Edom. And they think all of the Israelites are going there at the end of days. Starts with a P. Petra. Do you remember that? That was a $10,000 question right there. I was ready to write the check to you, Ned. So, uh, Petra. But if you read Josephus and other historians, the Jewish people in 87 didn't run to Petra. They ran to some place in the north. So, things that you need to just wrestle with. Another historian is Philo. He was a Jewish person down in uh, Alexandria, Egypt. But he writes very wonderfully about you know, uh, early Christianity in the context of the early church and how it developed and how it spread, um, what we call diaspora uh, theology, how things spread because of persecution and where they went out to. Uh, if you've got some pretty large dictionaries here, the Dictionary of Latter New Testament and its Development. Um, the other one is the Dictionary of the New Testament Background. Um, this is by Evans and Porter, both of these things. Light reading if you can't go to sleep at night. Door stops if you need them. But very, very valuable information if you're trying to figure out where John was living and how he was living and ideas and symbols. I have a dictionary of New Testament symbols um, just helping me to navigate that world. Why? I don't know it. I, don't, I didn't live 2,000 years ago. I don't know how people operated and what they thought. And so you have to wrestle with those types of things. Um, this is the Ecclesiastical History of Eusebius Pamphilius, uh, one of the first historians uh, coming out of the New Testament as well. Um, and then just some other works, The Patient Ferment of the Early Church, The Improbable Rise of Christianity in the Roman Empire. How did the church survive the persecutions of the Romans? Uh, the New Testament worlds from a cultural anthropology and backgrounds of early Christianity by Everett Ferguson, which is a classic work. Um, all that to say is this. You're not going to get cultural background by just looking at the, at the Bible. You've got to go outside of it and look at other helps, anthropological helps, social science helps. You have to understand the world in which John lived and the world in which he's writing, and then you'll come to a, a better conclusion as you're trying to interpret the text. And then the third one and the last one that is for us is what does it mean to, what does it mean to me? What is the biblical principles coming out of this? If it's future, is this speaking to my generation? Have I seen things that have come to pass that John would have never anticipated or John was anticipating or the early church was anticipating are those things are things that I have seen for example the establishment of Israel as a nation can a nation be born in a day answer it was in 1948 in May Israel became a nation all right a language that was thought dead was revived Hebrew um, so you know, there's things that we can look at and go, there were a lot of things that have been fulfilled in the scriptures that have been leading up to my life, where I live in my time, and I need to figure out, if, it's a, if I'm looking future, how this connects with me without violating the first two principles. Number one, number two, number three. So what does it say? What did it mean to them? And third, church, what does it mean to those are good biblical interpretive rules. So as we go into Revelation, uh, that's what we're going to be looking at. Um, Joseph and Deb, do I need to flip now screens and get me to the next one, if you would, please? So let's go to session two. And um, we're going to be starting uh, the, uh, the background and different perspectives of Revelation. <clears throat> You're going to need to bear with me tonight. It's going to be a little bit more lecture than I, I like, uh, but it has to do with positions in, perspect uh, in, uh, in perspective, and we just need to know this, all right? Because not everybody agrees on the interpretive um, work of Revelation itself. So the first one is this. Who was the human recipient or writer 
of the book of Revelation. Revelation 1 and 1 and 2. Can someone read that for me, please? Either on your phone or up on the screen, if you would. Revelation 1, verse 1 and 2. Can someone read that for me, please? Yes, Chris. Yeah, thank you, Chris. So who was the ultimate recipient of this revelation? John. Yeah, there's your word. But there's a couple options here. And so as we look at authorship, uh, we have to investigate that. So option number one is the most obvious. It's who, church? It's the Apostle John. It's one of the 12. It's the one that Jesus loved, or the beloved of John. All right, uh, brother of James, who by this time has been executed. Um, he had his head cut off by now. All right, Irenaeus, church father in Lyon, uh, France. Uh, he lived around A.D. 180, uh, was under the tutelage of Polycarp, bishop of Smyrna, who in turn was a disciple of who? John. So... Polycarp knew John personally, and, um, and Irenaeus studied under Polycarp. So we've got one person removed from a literal person who knew the Apostle John. Uh, who was in, uh, Irenaeus writes that John lived and died in Ephesus and was prisoner on the island of Patmos under the emperor Domitian. Uh, tradition has it that uh, uh, when Jesus died on the cross, do you remember what uh, Jesus said to John? Do you remember what he said to John? Take care of my mother. And tradition has it that John and Mary moved, left Jerusalem, actually after the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. At some point they moved to Ephesus uh, where she died and ultimately where uh, John ended up dying as well. So Irenaeus, uh, one of the early church fathers, testifies historically uh, that the person that wrote this was John himself under the, um, the persecution of Domitian, who was another one of those evil guys. Uh, Justin Martyr, uh, around 165, Clement of Alexandria in 215, and Tertullian in 220, all believe that John was the writer of the four Gospels, the three epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and also, for our sake, the book of Revelation. So we, we have some very strong historical data about authorship and who received this revelation and how it was then passed on to the churches. John was the writer of the four gospels, the three epistles, and then ultimately the revelation. Uh, receiving that from God the Father through Jesus, to, through an angel, to himself. Option number two, there are some people that believe that John was not the writer, but another John called John the Presbyter. All right, another word for a presbyter is simply what? Anybody know? You Presbyterians, come on now. This means elder, yeah, it's a, it's a leadership term. Uh, John the Elder or John the Presbyter. Dionysius of Alexandria, mid third century, and Eusebius, the first recognized history uh, historian around 300s. Um, that's this work here. Uh, did not believe that Apostle John wrote the letter, but another John cited in the extinct works of Papias. Uh, so there's no way of verifying that. That's why option two is a very bad option. Why is this important? First of all, it, it gives with it apostolic church authority. All right. God is delivering this very important document to one of Jesus' followers, one who was declared and proven uh, by signs, wonders, and by the Holy Spirit's uh, impression as far as giving him uh, scripture, uh, the apostolic authority itself. Second, 
validity of timing since John died in the late 80, 90s and John was given this book in, of Revelation towards the end of his life. So when we get to those particular historical or these viewpoints, you're going to see um, one of them says, we don't believe John wrote this towards the end of his life. We believe that it was written in A.D. 70. All right. Third, it's correct view of chapters 8 through 22. Past, present, or future. And that's going to be the distinguishing marks of the views that I'm going to give you, by the way. So there are some people in Christianity that look at Revelation and say, it's just a book of things that happened in the past. You can get your biblical principles out of it, but nothing futuristic is going to take place. So stop saying that. It, it's already been done and over with. All right. There are those who believe that it has to do with the present. And then there's those who have to do with, no, it's a future um, writing as things that are still yet to come. Um, and that's the reason for the particular writing itself. Uh, when was it written? Number one, it was written during a time of church. What's the word there? It was written during a time of persecution. We're going to find out that John was sent to Patmos basically as a political prisoner. Get the guy out of here. So send him to a rock where he'll probably die. And that was Patmos. All right. It was written during a time of persecution and trial for some of the recipients. Second, it was written to, for what purpose? To encourage believers that even if they should be called to suffer or even die for the faith, yet their vindication and the punishment of their enemies would be certain and not far off. And not only can we find this in the book of Revelation, but we can find it in the, in the epistles of Paul, um, First, Second Thessalonians, um, Peter, uh, James, um, you know, be encouraged. There is something yet coming. So if you think this world is, is unjust and you, we can't find the justice, it, it will be coming. So it was written to do that. Third, because of the supposed magnitude and scope of the persecution, it was believed to be under one of the imperial persecutions. Because of the supposed magnitude. The key word there in yellow is magnitude, but the key word for me is supposed. Supposed magnitude and scope of the persecution. They believed that it was wide. It was believed to be under one of the imperial, that is the Roman persecutions. For the only two imperial persecutions with this apparent magnitude and scope were... Number one, Nero, the demented individual who said fiddled why Rome burnt to the ground, A.D. 54 to 68. Uh, both Paul and Peter were uh, killed in 67. Uh, Peter was crucified upside down after watching his wife be crucified um, face in. They did that with women. So he, had, he watched his wife be murdered first, and then he was murdered. And then Paul, of course, because he was a Roman citizen, uh, was not crucified. He was beheaded. This was the popular opinion of most scholars up until the 1800s, actually. Um, and then the second opinion became more dominant, and it's actually the most dominant opinion now just because of historical data uh, archaeological data that's come forward and that is Domitian in AD 81 to 96 which then fits a later um, a writing date of the book of Revelation so John is not going to be talking about something that happened 10 or 20 years before he's talking about something that's going to be happening something in the future that's going to take place that's why this matters that's why timing matters Problem, there's no historical evidence of any large-scale persecution outside of Rome, but only local skirmishes led by Jews. However, under authorship, Irenaeus does state that John was imprisoned on Patmos during the reign of what Roman ruler, church? Domitian, absolutely. 
So there's no historical evidence that any large scale imperial persecution really took place. Most of that was in Rome itself or outside in the Roman provinces. It had to do with local areas. And um, so the, uh, the probable uh, emperor that John is receiving this revelation from was the Roman emperor Domitian. Why does it matter? Some think it matters because if you take an earlier date, a pre-fall of Jerusalem, the prophetic sections of chapters 8 to 22 are not applicable to a church, a future fulfillment. It has nothing to do with the future. The fall of Jerusalem in AD 70 under Rome was what was spoken of and therefore is historical and, next key word, church, it's done, it's complete. However, as we've discussed with prophetic church, remember those mountains I talked to you about at the end of last week? The prophetic mountains, an event can have both an immediate, immediate, and long-range fulfillment. Therefore, it can fit multiple positions. So let me run this so that you get it. So someone comes up to me, I'll introduce these to you right after this, and says, Dan, um, are you a, his, a historist or historist, historicist? Are you a preterist, uh, full or partial? Are you an idealist or spiritualist? Or are you a futurist in your interpretation of Revelation? <laughs> Chris says yes. You're not far off though actually because um, I'm three quarters there. The only one that I have a problem with is this one. I have a problem with the historicist position that says all of this happened in AD 70. You don't spend your time there. Live your life because at some point Jesus is just going to come back, be done with this whole thing, and we're heading into eternity. There's, it has a post-millennial, actually almost an amillennialist sort of a, a fit. I would say to my brother, who's a historicist, I would say, oh, I, I agree with you. I think it did happen in AD 70, but you don't understand prophetic mountains because sometimes God fulfills something here, but he's not done with it yet. Sometimes in this prophetic mountain that we think has a period, it just has an ellipsis after it. It has a dot, 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 because God is also going to use that same event now here. Does that make sense? So what we thought was over here historically may be done historically, but God has yet another another use for that information somewhere in the future that he's going to use. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's what we call typology, Doc. It's about... God gives me a picture of something here in reality, but he's typing it so that in the future, we're going to see that model here. So if I can take your example, Doc, of uh, Antiochus Epiphany, the fourth. Um, Epiphany, um, actually, Epiphanus means crazy or insane. That's the nickname they had for him. Guy was evil, all right? He's a type of something that was going to come. Now Antiochus Epiphany, who was a Seleucid, uh, which means in the Syrian area, was here after the Greeks, after Alexander the Great died and four of his generals broke up his property and took that. His dad got one, so Antiochus is here. Daniel talks about him. If you're talking about a really evil, evil guy, well, then I get to Rome and guess what evil guy I find there? Nero. So the Jewish people in Roman times, in John's time, would be reading Daniel and go, wait a minute, that sounds a whole lot like that guy, Daniel 9. Maybe that's the fulfillment of Daniel 9. Well, that's when you have to go, yeah, Antiochus was a really evil guy. Nero is a very evil guy. And guess who's coming down the road, church? Another really evil guy. 
who's going to be the epitome of everything else called the Antichrist. He's coming. So that's, that's how that fits in. So just remember those prophetic mountains. Hey, I've seen that somewhere before. Yeah, right there. Remember we looked at Isaiah 7 and 14. We looked at, uh, and a virgin uh, shall give birth to a son and she shall call his name Emmanuel. Well, who was that for? It was for Isaiah and his people. They needed a word from the Lord and God gave it. I'm with you. God is with you. Isaiah, your people, King Ahaz, I'm going to take care of this problem for you. But that was a dot, 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 because then we get to Matthew chapter 2, and we see Joseph, who's engaged to Mary, and the angel says, a virgin shall give birth to a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Yeah. Prophetic mountains, you just have to watch that in the scriptures. Just because something's over historically here doesn't mean that God is done with it yet. It might just be a picture of something yet to come so that we can look back at it and go, oh, yeah, I remember that. This is like that. And that's part of that journey, all right? So four approaches of perspectives of Revelation. The first one is the historicist approach. The people who held to this was, were Martin Luther, John Calvin, Zwingli, John Knox, Sir Isaac Newton, John Fox, John Wesley, Jonathan Edwards, George Whit Whitfield, Charles uh, Finney, C.H. Spurgeon, etc. So if you can look at that list of people, tell me uh, what time frame this approach started to flourish. Anybody know? 16, 14, 1500s, 1600s. It was during what period? Reformation. It was during the Reformation period that this historicist approach started to really flourish. That's important to me because I don't see that as a mainstream interpretive approach for the prior 1,000 years. <laughs> to me, that's important. To me, that says they're looking at the scripture from their cultural perspective, looking backwards, not looking at John and asking, what does it say? What does it mean to them? And then now what does it mean to me? They put number three in number one and started the ball rolling that way. It doesn't mean I don't agree with it. It just means don't be so decisive about this. The historical approach portrays Revelation as a church, next two words, as a sweeping look at church history from the apostolic times, from the times of the apostles to the present. And we're not talking about the 15, 1600s. We're talking about to us in the 20th century. That's the difficulty for me, is that John would have not been thinking like this. This is a, an anachronistic interpretive model. Do you know what anachronistic means? Chronos means what? Time. It means reading your own time back into something. All right? Uh, it's, it's taking something out of time and, and putting it into the discussion where it doesn't belong. That's kind of what this looks to me personally as I read and study through this. Uh, the problem is that chapters 6 to 19 seem to be fulfilled in a short period of time and not hundreds of years. So it's, it's a problem that the historicists have in their interpretive model of Revelation. They see the seals as the persecution of the early church, the bulls as the defeat of the Roman Empire, and the trumpets as the invasion of the Muslims. How they get that, I have no idea. Modified historical prophetical approach. The approach is very similar to the historical approach, but it focuses solely on what church? The seven churches, chapter 2 and chapter 3. So two books, two chapters out of the book of Revelation, and this is what drives their interpretive methodology. Okay? For example, the church at Ephesus represents the apostolic church. The church of Smyrna represents the persecuted church, Roman church. So that's going to be going up into about the 5th century. All right? The church of Pergamum represents the nationalized church of Constantine. Right, that's 300s 
fourth uh, century as well, 323. The church at Thyatira represents the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages. This is when the Roman Catholic Church is sort of at its zenith, if you would please, coming out of that. The Church of Sardis represents the Church of the, the Reformation. So once again, now we're catching up to where this position is actually rising under Luther and uh, Calvin and Zwingli, uh, John Knox, of course, um, Scottish Presbyterianism, those types of things. The Church of Philadelphia represents the great missionary sending church. It's one of the very few churches that Jesus doesn't have anything bad to say about. He talks about this open door, you know. Um, and of course, during the 1800s especially, and the early 1900s, there were a, it was a zenith of missionary act activity. That's when China Inland Mission was started. That's when the, the missions to India was started. It's, uh, it's when Livingston went down to South Africa. It's, you've got all of these great missionaries that are heading out and a historicist position would look at that and go, see, that church represents that time. Okay? The church of Laodicea represents the, our current modern day church. It's a church that's apostatized. We've, we've walked away from the Lord. We claim to be a church, but we don't follow any orthodox pra practices. We've moved so far away from what the church is supposed to be that uh, as Jesus would say, you're neither hot nor cold, and I'm going to do what with you? Do you remember? I'm going to vomit you. I'm going to spit you out of, the, out of my mouth. You're, you're useless to me. Okay. Uh, problem, it's totally subjective. <laughs> and predominantly focuses on the Western church without noting most events taking place in the East. The Eastern Church, especially the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Syrian Church, they stayed firm. They were vibrant churches all the way up. They don't reflect that. They, re they just reflect a, a Western perspective on things. Well, who would hold that position today? If, well, if you're part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you would hold that position. All right. Others probably do too, but that's the mainstay denomination that would pursue that. Of note, this approach is consistently what, church? Anti-Rome, anti-papacy, and sees the Pope as the Antichrist. And that doesn't surprise me because most of this comes out of what period of time? The Reformation, where they protested the, Roman, the abuses of the Roman Catholic Church at that time. All right? So you would naturally see the theology start to reflect that idea um, that the church is corrupt, and, but yet it's still totally subjective. All right. A preterist approach, partial and full. Adherence, R.C. Sproul, uh, Legionnaire Ministries, if you know R.C., uh, R.C. Sproul is past now, Kenneth Gentry. Uh, the word praetor in Latin is the word for church, past. It's the word for past. The preterist view sees everything revelation as happening in the past prior to AD 70 and the destruction of Jerusalem. I think I got my terms mixed up when I was talking about this with you. Um, I was thinking more of the preterist instead of the historicist. Um, the destruction of Jerusalem or up until the conversion of Constantine and the legalization of Christianity, which would be the early 300s. So a preterist is someone who says everything happened at 8070. There's, there's no future in this at all. All right. That is a preterist position. It recognizes that John was writing to real people, church, at a real time under real persecution. So there's something of substance to this position. That, that's what a full preterist is. Partial preterists hold this view, but also believe that certain elements are yet to be fulfilled because guess who hasn't come back yet? Jesus. So there are some things that are future fulfilled, but for the most part, um, preterist interpretation of Revelation says, no, 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 no. From chapter one to 22, it's all about AD 70. It's about the Romans taking over Jerusalem and the persecution that's what this is about. 
And that's where once again we can say, well, I, I get that, I understand that, but you don't understand the dot, dot, dots or the mountains that go with that, all right? It's tied closely with post-millennial view. Uh, in other words, that Jesus will not return until the 1,000 year period of restoration, which the church will usher into existence. A post-mill position, we're gonna talk about this in Revelation chapter one actually with the church of Ephesus, uh, because there were those who claimed to be apostles and prophets. And if you're not aware, there's, there's an, a group of churches in our lifetime called the New Apostolic Reformation, the NARM, New Apostolic Reformation Movement, that fall into this. They believe that they have the authority as the new apostles and prophets to now speak into the church and to move it forward so that the church basically transforms the entire planet and brings in this beautiful world so that all Jesus has to do is show up and take over. I don't know about you, but I don't think that's happening right now. Jim? The two guys. R.C. Sproul? Jo uh, yeah, Sproul and Gentry would be preterists. No, no, they're not part of the new apostolic reformation movement. Um, that has to do with a little bit more of the charismatic side of things. R.C. Sproul and Kenneth Gentry are very conservative uh, theologians. So R.C. Sproul was, he passed. Yeah, so, but when we get to that, uh, the, the new apostolic reformation movement, those types of pastors and, and so-called theologians, um, they're going to fall prey to some of that stuff, which is what we have to be very, very aware of and conscious of. So R.C. Sproul, uh, Kenneth Gentry, uh, they held to Revelation is A.D. 70. It's a historical event. We can gather spiritual things out of that that will help us as believers because all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for correction, rebuke, instruction, um, you know, so it has value to us as principles, but it has nothing to do with the future per se. That would be a preterist view. Problem, it's a book about what is to come, including the return of Christ and a time of restoration, which has not happened. All the church... Uh, did come into a place of peace and legality. It quickly spiraled down under internal corruption and external subjugation. For example, the Muslims, the Turks, and the Mongol invasions uh, that basically decimated, in particular, uh, the Eastern Church itself. All right. So the historicist position, it, it, it looks backwards from our perspective and it tries to find uh, epics or eras where one of the seven churches, this is partial preterist, where they fit in our time frame. They're extrapolating things, they're bringing things in. A preterist says, we believe that John received this writing and they would probably take an earlier writing date now because John could not have written this in the 90s. He would have written this in the 60s or late 60s, heading into the trouble that was going to take place in AD 70. So it's just a historical document. That's how we're interpreting Revelation. Next, an idealist or a spiritualist approach. B.B. Warfield uh, taught at Westminster, out on the East Coast for many, many years. Uh, reformed churches, uh, a lot of the things that my background is out of. The idealist approach takes a universal approach and views the book of Revelation as simply what, church? To, it's a timeless struggle between good and evil. Its objective is to convey spiritual truths and is unrelated to actual events. So it's not about what is to come. It's just basically saying, look, our world is is constantly about good and evil. It's really bad guys like Antiochus Epiphanes and Nero and Domitian and maybe Mussolini and Hitler and yes, in Cambodia, I mean, it's, it's full of, as John would say in his epistles, antichrists plural, 
It's, it's full of that. So we're not, John isn't receiving something that's trying to pinpoint something that's going to come. He's just receiving this general overview of humanity and saying, here's the life that people are going to have to live. Now learn the lessons from this. That's what a spiritualist or an idealist perspective would take place or would want to understand. This view is generally tied to an amillennialism or a no millennial view. Uh, it means there is, uh, we've been in tribulation since Jesus left. <laughs> Jesus, in fact, said that, didn't he? In this world, you shall have tribulation. It started uh, as soon as Jesus left this world, it hasn't stopped. And at some point, he's just going to come back and usher us into uh, eternity. Problem, it wasn't written to a historical group of people in a historical context. It was written to a historical group of people in a historical context with a prophetic utterance connected to real key church. Here's the key word, real future events. Because you can't look backwards and say this happened. They, they have to be forward looking or forward moving. The last one is this, the futurist approach. Uh, most Baptists, uh, that was my background, Pentecostals, independents, evangelicals, as we are evangelical Presbyterians. So a lot of you will probably hold to this uh, particular approach. The futurist approach holds that chapters 4 through 22 are what? Their future events to literally happen. They're not spiritualized, they're not ideals, they're things that are going to happen. God is literally going to judge the world. One third of the seas are going to be killed, the fish in the sea. One third of the grass is going to be burned up. One third of humanity is going to die. All of that, we look at that and go, wow, uh, that's something that's going to happen in the future. That's not just some ideal way of looking at things. It has its problems. It's closely tied to premillennialism, uh, millennialism, which means we believe uh, that um, the rapture of the church, the, the church goes out, the tribulation comes in, the great tribulation, the seven, 70th week of Daniel, um, in Daniel uh, chapter nine, and um, that Jesus is going to come back and usher in a thousand year reign of restoration uh, that will be setting up his earthly kingdom. Problem, it's often found to be too literal in its interpretation. That's where we have to be careful with language and reading facts in the text that are not there. It also assumes a timeline that is unsubstantiated in the text itself. And that's where we have to be very, very careful about the narrative. Revelation is very difficult in this way because when we get started, um, as I Ted told you in the previous kind of lectures, when you get to chapter four and five, it's a heavenly throne room. When you get to chapter six, it's the seal judgments that are gonna be taking place on earth. Then we have an interlude. Then we see 144,000 people being stamped that are evangelists and a great multitude that have died in the tribulation period. Then we get to chapter eight, which is actually the seventh seal, which is actually the first trumpet. Then we get to nine, which is the woes, and 10, the scroll, and 11, the two witnesses, and 12, you see what I'm saying? So it's not, real, it's not like reading a history uh, narrative where you're looking at dates and events and times and moving forward. You have to be careful about that. Is it forward moving? I believe it is, but it does this. <laughs> it, it, it moves us all over. It's not a straight line. It, it moves us to heaven and then to earth and then to heaven and then to earth and it keeps us moving forward, but we have to pay attention to that. So that timeline is a little bit difficult to navigate in regards to that. Um, that's it, let me go with review with you, all right? So a historicist position Ready? Next week, I'm going to give you about a hundred, uh, you know, numbered quiz on this. So make sure that you're ready. A historic, historicist position looks at Revelation as 
um, particular times in the church, the times of the apostles, the time of the Roman government, the Roman church, the time of the Middle Ages, the time of the Reformation, the time of whatever it may be. A, a preterist position says, no, 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 Revelation is about 80, 70. It's all history. You can read about it in the textbooks. This is what happened. And this is what John was writing about. It means that John did not write this book in the 90s. John wrote it in the 60s. That's why the date of this is important. Because John is not looking back and saying stuff. John is in the middle of it. John is in the midst of the persecution. And he's writing about it. All right? That's 87. An idealist or a spiritualist perspective looks at the book of Revelation. It sort of backs out and looks at it and says, you know, I've, I've seen this, this movie before. I, I've seen it in Genesis. I've seen it in Exodus. I've seen it in Numbers. I, I, I've seen good things happen and bad people rise up and then bad things happen and then some good guy shows up. And it's, it's just... It's the cycle of the history of God, of good, evil, and then Jesus is going to show up and we're going to be done with it. That's an idealist or a spiritualist perspective. A futurist perspective looks at the text literally in Romans, or Revelation chapter 1, when Jesus says, John, I'm going to tell you what, what was that you just saw, what is, the seven churches of Laodicea, and what will be. It has to do with the image you're just seeing now of me. Second, it's going to be talking about the seven churches that you are very well acquainted with, and it's my word to the churches right now. And it's going to be talking about now things that are going to be coming in the future that have not yet occurred. That's a futurist position. So which one do I hold? Yes. Absolutely. Um, I am at heart a futurist. I take the Bible literally. Um, I think there's a future events coming in Revelation 4 to 22. Uh, so those are things I'm looking at. All right. I also hold to an idealist and a spiritual position because I do believe that this is a cycle. I can see it. I see the prophetic mountains. It happened here, it happened here, it happened here, and it's going to happen there. But that's going to be the culmination of it. I'm also a preterist because I believe it happened in AD 70. I believe that there's some historical data that we need to look at and say, yeah, this, these people struggled and Jesus was speaking to that as well. I have a hard time being a historicist uh, just because it, it has a tendency to look from a thousand years after the event back into John's world and brings in these ideas into the text that you don't see. John would not have been looking at his writings going, oh yeah, 2,000 years from now, there's going to be a church that fits Laodicea. I don't think John was doing that. I think John looked at the church of Laodicea and said, I know that church. I know why Jesus said that. It runs water from the mountains. By the time it gets down through the Roman aqueduct, it's not it's not cold anymore, it's not hot, it's lukewarm, and you can't drink it. I get that. Does that make sense? So everything had a place right there. So, so three out of the four, I can go, yeah, I, I get that. I, I'll, I'll agree to that. If somebody gets real dogmatic on me, then I can argue the other two points and cause them grief. All right? So, but, so that's what we have to live with open hands a little bit with each other and and so you're going to bump into people who hold one of those four positions and they may not be holding yours. And so that's why it's good to know what you believe and why you believe it. And, um, and so for our sake, uh, I cannot take all four positions and move them through. Um, <laughs> I can only take one or we're going to spend forever on this one. All right. So we're going to take the the pre-millennial futurist position when we get into Revelation. We're just going to take that position um, because it seems to be the most common in our circles. 
Uh, every once in a while, I'm going to stop and say, how would a historicist view this? Or how would a preterist view this? Or how would an idealist navigate this? But for the most part, we're going to do a pre-trib, pre-mill, futurist perspective as we look at Revelation. That's what we're going to hold on to. And uh, if you disagree with me, that's okay. We'll navigate it. All right? Any questions? Yes, Chris? Yes, he was released off of the island of Patmos when Domitian died. There was a prisoner release and he left the island. So tradition says that he ended up in Ephesus with Mary and that's where they both lived out their, their days. Which is interesting because that's where Timothy was a pastor, by the way. Uh, so some pretty high powered people in that town. Yeah, tradition says that. So. Any other questions? Are y'all following me? Do I need to start this whole thing over again? Yes. No, we're not going to. We're going to get into the text. So uh, next week, enough of the prep stuff. I hope I've gotten you to a place. Hey, thanks, by the way, for hanging in there with me. I know that the last three sessions were rough. Uh, they're rough for me to teach because they're not the most interesting things. Uh, but you, there are things that you need to know so that when you, we get into Revelation, we won't have the complications of wrong interpretation. And all God's people said, please. Yeah, we want to make sure that we enter into the text right so that we can get the most from it. And that's what we're after. So next week, Lord willing, uh, we are going to start Revelation 1 and start the journey together. And all God's people said, please. Yeah, you can say, thank God. That works as well. All right, let me pray for us. God, we love you. Thanks for the night. Uh, thanks for the endurance of your people. I know, Lord, that these things are, are difficult. Um, prep work often is the most laborious of, of efforts. Uh, we all, we all want to get uh, to the exciting stuff. And um, so thank you, Lord, for their patience with me. And uh, Lord, as we kind of move forward, that we, we all have a, a good starting place. We all know where we're going to be starting from. And, um, and we just pray that you'll speak to us. I'm reminded as we close that Revelation 1 and Revelation 22 both say that we are blessed people because we are reading this book and, um, and paying attention to it. And so thank you for that, Lord. Give us safety to our homes tonight. Bless us, Lord. Keep us safe in our travels. And uh, Lord, would you bring us back Sunday just to worship you well. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said with me, please. Amen. Thank you, church. Appreciate it very much. You're welcome, Chris.